This is Global Mining News, available worldwide on the internet. Welcome to the Northern Miner Podcast. My name is Adrian Pocabelli, and what an electric start to the new year. Happy New Year, everybody. What an electric start in the crypto markets. Oh my God. You know, it's pretty interesting in the stock market too, but what a difference. I don't know, for those of you out there that follow the more speculative side of things in the financial markets, you might know who James Dines is. James Dines is how I got into this whole business one afternoon when I was bored after work and I saw this get-rich-quick scheme called the Dines Letter, which was seen to buy rare earth stocks, and I did, and I actually, yeah, I 5X'd out of that by the time that was all done. Of course, my uh, brother and mom FOMO'd in, and they, <laughs> they lost probably 80 or 90% of their money, so be very careful in these markets, folks. Um, yeah, but what a start. So crypto markets go bananas, and, but back to James Dines, one of the great newsletter writers, Dines Letter, I think he, I'm not sure if he read The Northern Miner or not, but we had a relationship with him at one point where he got a free subscription and we got a free subscription. I don't know what happened to that, uh, but it was pretty cool. Anyways, that's how I got into this whole business. Anyways, so he would make a big deal of the first three trading days of the year. That was kind of because there is kind of, you know, it's kind of one of these seasonality type qualitative information and you know, a lot of these people, a lot of the financial market speculation prediction is tea leaf reading, but, you know, there is something to be said and there are correlations, right? And as the scientists will tell you, correlation is not causation, but it's pretty interesting nevertheless. And maybe sometimes it does tell you something. And yeah, the first three trading days of the year can be very significant. Crypto trades 24-7. So out of the gate, crypto went bananas. I mean, we have uh, Bitcoin at 31000 holding steady. It was up at $34,000. For those of you who remember, I mean, it was only in November, the beginning of November at the Global Mining Symposium. I had a little brief appearance, and I remember telling Anthony, the Northern Miner Group publisher, that Bitcoin had just passed $16,000. Well, we've just passed like 31, actually we're up at 34. And it went up like $5,000 in a weekend. Ethereum which just goes up, it does nothing forever, and then it goes up lightning fast. That's a 50%. It's at $1,000. And so if we look at the stock market now, the stock market had a pretty bad day. It was down 400 points. From what I remember, let's just take a closer look, give you an accurate reading. CNBC. And it's funny, as I check CNBC, JP Morgan says Bitcoin could rise to $146,000 long term. Well, that's a pretty low forecast compared to what other people are saying. But even JP Morgan, which I think two years ago, Jamie Dimon said he'd fire anybody that mentioned Bitcoin. Uh, they're doing an about face. And as I mentioned last episode, I think it's because of this pressure from retail. Like they have to say this stuff now because retail will go somewhere else because the gains are not the same. The gains you're seeing in the crypto market, which is just a growing market by nature right now, they are not the same kind of gains that you see in the stock market, okay? It's almost like the stock market measures in terms of percent, while the crypto market measures in terms of Xs, okay? And so like when you talk about 2% interest, like we were saying last time, uh, 3% on a municipal bond, and then calling that a victory, as the money supply is increased by 20%, this is just getting harder and harder to pedal while there is an alternative market that is going ballistic, right? So, I mean, and another sort of strange phenomenon of when you get involved in the crypto markets, and be very careful, folks, these are very immature markets. You know, like I describe them as like, it's like Wall Street in the 1920s. It's like a rumor is out of control. Everything is narrative. So this is my kind of market. And there are 
robots and algo, but it's nothing like the regular market. So you actually have a better chance if you're kind of smart about things, if you're a good investor. Everybody thinks they are, but not everybody is. But I think you have a better chance at sort of outthinking the market by, you know, being one step ahead than you are in the stock market, which just seems totally random, other than the fact that maybe it goes up over time and that maybe, say, tech is good. So Kathy Wood, she likes genomics, you know. So, yeah, like, I mean, if I, again, this is an investment advice, but if I was sort of like a more conservative portfolio manager, I would say crypto commodities and biotech or genomics, as Kathy Wood puts it. And just a final part on this whole sort of start of the year investment theme, you know what Kathy Wood does? And Kathy Wood is one of those famous investors who basically called Tesla right. And she's a famous sort of tech investor. She sees Bitcoin at 500,000. Super bullish on Bitcoin. She, yeah, it's a very great interview that's on Bloomberg on YouTube that you can find half an hour. And you know what she does? She'll buy into something like Tesla, but if she feels like it's overbought or things are just too out of control and they want to go back to a quote unquote cash position, you know what their cash position is? It's like Microsoft. It's like the FANG stocks are their cash position. So it's, and it's the same thing in crypto. You go into these little altcoins and the way that, you know, you watch these YouTubers and the way it works is you go into these little altcoins and then once you feel things are overbought, then you go back into Ethereum and Bitcoin and those are growing. That's the strategy. It's all easier said than done. Again, not investment advice, but if you're kind of wondering what the heck is going on out there or what some people are thinking, there you have it. So we have a very interesting show coming up. We have Andrew Cheadle from the Global Mining Symposium in conversation with Anthony Vaccaro from the Northern Miner, publisher. And they discuss the UN sustainability goals, and there are 17 of them, and what the mining industry can do in order to help the UN achieve these goals by 2030. And they are very big goals. And it's also just a conversation on how the mining industry can position itself from in the community in the 2020s and kind of how it can see itself and the role it plays and what it can do. And really, in a sense, being proactive in the sense of helping the community out rather than just trying to get in there and get what you can at the lowest cost possible. So again, it's this ESG thing. It hasn't gone away. It is still here. So that is coming up and we have some very fascinating news stories. I'm going to quickly look over a Guardian article from December, which went over the whole Rio Tinto thing, just to give you guys kind of like the summary of what happened there, just something very quick. And then we're going to go into our news stories. So lots coming up. If you want to find us online, you can find us at northernminer.com. You can find us on Twitter at Northern Miner. You can find us on Instagram at The Northern Miner. And on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, where we also host these podcasts and wherever podcasts are available. And with that, let's turn to the news. Let's start with this Guardian article from December because we covered this Rio Tinto story pretty closely and I thought it would be just kind of good for us to see the fallout. This is from December 9th. Juke and Gorge Inquiry, Rio Tinto's decision to blow up indigenous rock shelters, quote, inexcusable. And the subheadline Parliament Committee says miner must negotiate a compensation deal with traditional owners and, quote, ensure a full reconstruction, end quote, of the caves. They have to rebuild the caves. A parliamentary inquiry into the destruction of the 46,000-year-old caves has delivered a scathing report criticizing the actions of Rio Tinto and calling for the Western Australian government to put a stop to the destruction of heritage until new laws are passed. A majority bipartisan interim report said Rio Tinto's decision to destroy two rock shelters in Jukin Gorge against the wishes of the traditional owners and despite knowing the archaeological value of the site was, quote, inexcusable, end quote. And the report continues, quote, Rio knew the value of what they were destroying, but blew it up anyway, end quote. Now, they recommend a moratorium on developing heritage sites. And then we have Senator Pat Dodson came out 
and it sounds like he was one of the authors of the report. And he said, quote, whilst our report is called Never Again, it's in a legislative environment where there's still capacity for an organization or a company to destroy such a site. So we have a serious problem. The report recommended the Australian government outlaw the use of gag clauses and agreements between mining companies and traditional owners, which prevent traditional owners from speaking publicly against the destruction of their heritage. It also recommended that. So this is the fallout, which is basically why I wanted to read this. These are the recommendations of what Rio Tinto should have to do. Rio Tinto must negotiate a restitution package with the Putu, Kunti, Kurama, and Pinikura peoples, the PKKP, and ensure a full reconstruction of the rock shelters and remediation of the site at its own expense. I mean... How do they even reconstruct something like that? Wow. Rio must commit to a permanent moratorium on mining in the Juke and Gorge area. So you're done in that area. All mining companies, including Rio Tinto, should undertake an independent review of all agreements with traditional owners and remove any gag clauses or restrictions in existing agreements. BHP got ahead of this and said that they would, even though it's in the agreement, they said they would have no problem with people speaking out. Another point, all mining companies should commit to a voluntary moratorium on applying for new Section 18 permissions until new Aboriginal heritage laws are passed. So basically nobody should try and do any sort of development on slightly controversial Aboriginal heritage areas. Rio Tinto should commit to a stay on actions on the 1,700 Aboriginal heritage sites, which it currently has permission to destroy. The Western Australian government should urgently establish new procedures to improve the regulation of Aboriginal heritage and undertake a mapping and truth-telling process to record all sites that have been destroyed or damaged. And finally, the Federal Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Act 1984 be urgently reviewed and responsibility for the legislation revert to the minister for Aboriginal affairs. Finally, before we move on, Dodson said the failures that led to the Juke and Gorge disaster, quote, did not happen out of the blue. So, you read the whole thing on The Guardian. Just put in Juke and Gorge Inquiry, December 9th, and there's a lot more there, but that was the fallout. So I did want to touch that because we spent a few shows on that. Moving on, and actually, this is kind of a late-breaking one that I got off mining.com because it relates directly, and I'm just going to go into the headline. Trump to approve land swap for Rio Tinto's Resolution Copper Project. U.S. President Donald Trump's outgoing administration plans to approve a controversial land swap needed for Rio Tinto and partners to build an Arizona Arizona copper mining project that Native American tribes say will destroy sites of cultural and religious value. Now, let's see if Rio Tinto has learned their lesson, because they may not even want to have anything to do with this. At this point, who knows? They have a new CEO. This will be a very interesting one to watch because some people felt that the new CEO was too within the corporate culture of Rio Tinto and that they needed someone completely different. I said when we had that story, let's give the guy a chance. Now, I mean, I think he's going to be put on the spot because here we go again. This time in a U.S. context, what are they going to do? Are they going to push to destroy Native American cultural and religious sites? You know, no matter how significant or insignificant you might think they are as the CEO of Rio Tinto, can you even go near that with a 100-foot pole? I don't think so. But I guess we're going to see because I would think that you just have to back off. I mean, you just have to back off, at least for a year, and you just need to, all of these kind of sites, you're just going to have to chill, Rio Tinto. That's what I think, and and just go super slow. Uh, You basically want the people that are running those sites or that are affected to basically be saying, yes, we want Rio Tinto there. And if you don't have that, I don't see how you can go ahead at this point, this soon after the last disaster in Australia. So, continuing on, Las Bombas blockades affect Peru copper shipments. So, there's a huge copper mine in Peru called Las Bombas, and there is a blockade of the shipments of copper that are coming from the mine. This is by Valentina Ruiz Leotode from mining.com. 
In a December 29th communique reproduced by state-owned news agency Andina, the Peruvian Ministry of Energy and Mines expressed its opposition to the blockades taking place on the southern runway, which are hindering the transport of copper concentrate and personnel to and from MMG's Las Bombas mine. The activists launched their protest action two weeks ago in the Valil district, part of the Cusco region, about 200 kilometers from the mine. The activists demand the review of an agreement signed in September between Las Bambas and the Belil Chumbivilcas district, which stipulates that the company has to finance sustainable development projects for up to $348,000 U.S. over the next two years, as well as making spot payments to families impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. But people in Belil want the sum to increase to about $1.3 million. And we have a quote from the Peruvian Ministry of Energy and Mines, the current leader of the blockades want to ignore the agreement and are demanding a much higher financial contribution without providing reasons for this increment or justifying how such resources would be spent. End quote. The ministry said the blockaders are being intransigent and thus are obstructing mediation efforts led by the government to tend to their needs and restore public order. MMG issued a press release on December 24th stating that the company is, quote, deeply frustrated, end quote, by the blockade. And we have a statement, quote, Las Bombas has been fulfilling its commitments with all communities along the Hall Road. This includes additional commitments to support sustainable development projects that were made to the Valil District authorities and to Valil communities in September and November 2020. And the miner warned that there would be an impact on personnel and supply logistics and production was likely to be delayed. Las Bombas is the world's ninth largest copper mine and is thought to produce about 2% of global production. So pretty big operation there. So that is Las Bombas. Continuing on, we have Lucapa. Australia's Lucapa Diamond have a diamond mine in Angola called the Lulo Mine. And they have found a 113 karat diamond at Lulo. And you can see the picture on the northernminer.com. Looks like a pretty big piece of rock. The company said the discovery was, quote, particularly significant and quote, as it demonstrated that large high-value diamonds are present in the area that is the focus of its exploration program. So Angola is the world's fifth diamond producer by value and number six by volume. Its diamond industry, which began a century ago under Portuguese colonial rule, is successfully being liberalized. So big diamond found in Angola. And we have another diamond Story, over 3,000 diamonds recovered from Star Orion South Project in Saskatchewan. I believe there's a lawsuit between Star Diamond and Rio Tinto. And this is by Alicia Hyatt, editor-in-chief of the Canadian Mining Journal. Star Diamond has recovered 3,534 diamonds weighing 210 carats from its ninth bulk sample trench excavated on the Star Kimberlite at the Star Orion South Project in Saskatchewan. The project is a joint venture with Rio Tinto, which undertook the excavation of the Ninth Trench in 2019. According to Star Diamond, among the thousands of rocks discovered from the trench, three were large, 10, 8, and 7 carat type 2A diamonds, while 25 diamonds were greater than 1 carat. And this is located, this mine, I'm from Saskatchewan, so I know Prince Albert. Uh, we used to drive through it. Often you drive through Prince Albert when you're going to Northern Lakes. If you're driving from Saskatchewan, I think it's the third biggest city in Saskatchewan, I believe. There's uh, Saskatoon, Regina, and Prince Albert. And so this diamond mine is by Prince Albert. It's a large, low-grade project that contains both large diamonds and rare type 2A stones. Uh, the JV partners are engaged in a legal battle over accusations by Star Diamond that Rio Tinto improperly exercised its options to obtain a majority ownership stake in the proposed operation. In August, a Canadian court ruled that Star Diamond had grounds to take its legal fight with Rio Tinto to court, but a trial date has yet to be set. Yeah, so, you know, Rio Tinto's 2020 legacy is split into 2021. So another issue for the new CEO over there, and we're paying attention, Pure Gold, they are a Canada's newest gold producer. And they have poured first gold. This is by Trish Saywell, Northern Miner Editor-in-Chief. Pure Gold Mining poured its first gold in the final week of 2020 at its Pure Gold Mine in Red Lake, Ontario. And the company expects to reach commercial production by the end of the first quarter of 2021. And we have a quote from Darren LeBrenz, Pure Gold President and CEO. 
Quote, to build a mine at any time requires a complete team effort comprised of dedicated, driven, and focused individuals. To do so under the unique challenges of 2020 speaks to the quality and dedication of the entire team. So there you have it. Just wanted to touch on that. There's a new gold mine, new gold producer in Canada. Pure gold is going online. And finally, Fitch forecasts rebound in zinc production. And I guess that's unsurprising based on what the zinc price has been doing. This is by Amanda Stutt. From mining.com, global zinc mine output will recover in the coming years following several years of decline. Fitch Solution forecasts in its latest industry report, adding that after contracting by almost 10% between 2013 and 2020, annual output will commence a multi-year uptrend starting in 2021. High prices by historical standards have encouraged investment into a pipeline of new projects and restarts, which will continue to come online in 2021. Elevated zinc prices relative to historical levels will encourage investment in new projects, expansions, and restarts. Fish asserts. So interesting. And China looks like they will be the largest producer. Peru will be one of the top producers in the coming years. And Australia should have a positive trajectory, according to Fitch. So there you have it. So people are putting their zinc operations back online. It's a priority. It's had quite a jump here, and so let's turn to metal prices and see the latest on what's going on over there. prices, we'd like to thank our friends at mining.com slash markets for providing us with these prices each and every week. And on January 5th, gold is trading at $1,950.26 per ounce. That is $74 higher than last week's quote. And gold has been pretty impressive. Steady gain really since one, two, three, four, five, six weeks ago when it was down at $1,805. So continues its steady climb week by week, $1,950 per ounce. Silver is trading at $27.39. That is $1.17 higher than last week's quote. Platinum is trading at $1,081.70 per ounce. That is $67 higher in last week's quote, and palladium is trading at $2,434.54 per ounce. That is $83 higher than last week's quote. And turning to our industrial metals, copper is two cents lower at $3.51 per pound. Aluminum is two cents lower at 90 cents per pound. Lead is unchanged at 89 cents per pound. And nickel is down 19 cents at $7.50 per pound. Tin continues climbing at $9.32 per pound. That is 12 cents higher than last week's quote. And cobalt is unchanged at $14.52. And zinc is 4 cents lower at $1.24 per pound. So what do we see? The precious metals have been doing a very steady, almost stealthy climb higher just incrementally moving bit by bit. And before you know it, silver's at $27.39 per pound. Meanwhile, industrial metals are a touch lower, but really what I see is a consolidation at elevated prices, probably getting ready for its next move higher. Who knows? And with that, those are your metal prices. And coming up, we have Andrew Cheadle, advisor to mining companies. He's on the board of Condor Gold and Troilus Gold Corp. And he volunteers on the advisory councils of the Development Partner Institute, the Canada International Finance Corporation Africa Local Economic Development Partnership. And he is a director of International Women in Mining. Anthony Vaccaro, Northern Miner Group publisher, interviews him and he gives a lengthy introduction. So with that, I hope you enjoy the conversation and we will see you on the other side. My favorite people in the mining industry, Mr. Andrew Cheadle. 
Andrew is an experienced geoscientist. He's a seasoned CEO and director within the mining industry. As a professional geoscientist and graduate of the Royal School of Mines, Imperial College London, his 30 plus years uh, of an international career has encompassed both the senior and junior mining sectors. Andrew's based in both London and Toronto. He is a true man of the world. He sought after advisor to the minerals industry, specializing in technical assessments, corporate development, and investment. He sits on the board of directors at Condor Gold, Troilus Gold, Tanzanian Gold, and he also volunteers on the advisory councils of the Development Partner Institute, the Canadian International Finance Corporation, Africa Local Development Partnership, and as a director of international women in mining. I don't know how he makes the time for all this. He's also considered a go-to expert on the future of mining when it comes to strong social issues, ESG, diversity, all areas that Andrew has a lot of expertise and can advise the industry on the where we need to get to. And it is on that front. And there's Andrew there. Andrew, welcome to the Global Mining Symposium. It's wonderful to see you. Yeah. Hi, Anthony. It's uh, great to see you and uh, greetings to all those that are participating uh, online. And uh, I'm in London today. So greetings from this side of the pond as well. Fantastic. As I mentioned in my intro to you, you are a man of the world and you do have residence in Toronto and London. You have both of the main capital markets in the mining sector very well covered. Yeah. How are you finding traveling in these difficult times? Yeah, it's <laughs> that's a really good question, Anthony. Um, it's it's okay is the answer. You just have to be prepared. I think the the most tricky thing is the the two weeks uh, quarantine. Both sides of the Atlantic are going into Canada and coming back into the UK. So I've got a trip coming up to Toronto. Uh, no doubt we'll uh, find time to catch up. But uh, you know it's four weeks of uh, quarantine for two weeks on the ground. I hope you have lots of good reading material if you're going to be cooped up for two weeks on either side. Either that or I'll write something. <laughs> well, you've been doing a really good job of that. So Andrew has been contributing to the Northern Miner. Somehow he even has found a little bit of time for that. Did a fantastic article for us on impact investing originally. And then he's here today to talk about his most recent contribution, which was published in early October on the UN's sustainability development goals and what the implications are and could be for the mining industry. Super important topic, Andrew. It's interesting, even this is now our yeah. third virtual symposium, as you well know, being so dialed yeah. in to uh, what's going on in the industry at all times. And the amount of questions that we are even seeing from the audience, specifically about the UN's development goals, really alerted us to you know how important this could be. So your story was very timely on that front. I guess maybe, Andrew, a nice place to start would for our audience, if you could just summarize what those sustainable uh, development goals are from the UN. Yeah, Anthony, thank you very much. And uh, once again, thank you for having me. Yeah, so the sustainable development goals by the United Nations uh, were adopted by all member states uh, in 2015. And in essence, it was a universal call to action to end po poverty, protect the planet, and ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity by 2030. So there's 17 goals they're designed and set out to transform our world put simply to make it a better place to live for, for everybody so whether it's a poor country a rich country or middle income the whole idea is everyone's working together to say for example end poverty and, and these strategies go in hand in hand with building economic growth that address a, a range of social needs uh, education health job opportunities whilst also tackling climate change and environmental protection and some of these um, in, include several life-changing zeros, as the UN calls it, zero poverty, zero hunger, zero AIDS, and of course, one that's very uh, dear to my heart, zero discrimination against uh, women and girls. Uh, so everyone is needed to reach these targets. It, it is complex, but we do have the creativity and the resources to do that. And, and mining has a very special place as we move towards uh, these goals, and, and particularly the next 10 years, declared the uh, decade of action by the United Nations on the SDGs. I'm glad that you used the abbreviation there because that's a nice segue for me for my next question. SDGs is what these are going by. Yeah. A lot of letters. There's SDGs. There's also ESG, which is a very, very important within the industry as well. I wonder if you can tie these two together. And let me phrase this so it's not an overly facile question. 
the question would be is which is the higher standard? That being if a company decided to get really serious and follow SDG, the UN's SDGs, are they de facto then uh, coming up with a good ESG policy? Where's the overlap in the, the cross-section between companies having a good ESG policy and following the SDG? Yeah. So, Anthony, it, it is uh, another fabulous question from you. The two things are very much related and interwoven, right? So whether you're looking at environmental, social, and governance issues, ESG, and, and as we've talked before, it, you know, it seems sometimes when we're doing investor presentations, these, this is almost the only discussion at the table, not just in mining, throughout all industries, uh, throughout the world at the moment, as we work and we realize that, of course, we, we shouldn't be polluting the environment. We shouldn't be destroying people's um, access to clean water. We should be socially engaged. And of course, as companies run, there has to be lots of good governance in our companies as well. So the way I, I personally look at it uh, is that the ESGs are standards and procedures that we want to put in place to make sure that we're doing Good. They were not, if you like, they protect the downside. We don't want to fall foul of environmental laws. We don't want to end up um, in newspapers for dam failures or other uh, issues, right? We want to be seen to be having good governance of our companies, as, especially as they interface in society and interact uh, and interface with often governments in third world countries, which is very much the in developing nations, which is very much a part of our remit. So ESG brings to mind those environmental uh, issues very much, social issues, governance issues, but the sustainable development goals, it's a much broader purpose. And it's a matter of a lens, if you like, that we're looking through. So what do our activities that we do in mining, how do they fit? How do we work towards achieving those sustainable development goals? We call it a, a purpose, if you like. Uh, there's a very clear purpose driven to that, not just avoiding doing something wrong, but rather working towards doing something good, having a, a purpose to drive us. So in that sense, much more kind of ethics based, would you say, whereas ESG is more technical and practical? Is that a helpful way to think of it or maybe not at all? No, I, I wouldn't think of it that way. I mean, the, the, they're all ethically based, right? And um, you know, there's no standards to the SDGs. These are said earlier, but calls to action. So let's just say we want to talk about gender equality, right? That's uh, we, we do see in Canada, for example, um, now uh, guidelines um, in, in terms of certainly directors on boards towards sort of bringing more gender equality, but there's nothing in the companies in, in terms of, say, positions of geologists or engineers. We, we certainly have MIR and other uh, institutions that encourage us, but it's not a law. But it would almost say it's good governance to be working on having greater gender equality. We don't want to be discriminating um, against anybody. So that would fit in with uh, SDG number five, which is all around gender equality. That's a very helpful, very succinct way of uh, parsing that out a bit for us. Now, you do mention in your article a couple of key reports on mining and SDGs yeah. that came out in September. Can you tell us what do those reports say about how the mining industry is doing on this front overall? So they, they were very timely reports, and they certainly helped me to write, uh, write the article, Anthony, and, and um, thank you to, to the authors of, of both of them. The first one was by the Responsible Mining Framework in conjunction with the Columbia Center of, on Sustainable Investment. Now, both of these are NGOs, but they're also looking at our industry in a very constructive way. And that report was titled Mining and the SDGs, a 2020 Status Update. They reviewed the public reporting of 38 major mining companies. And whilst they see encouraging stats, they recognize that there's much work to be done. So the report really addresses the gap. It's also built uh, on the report in Atlas mapping mining to SDGs that was published um, in around about 2016. The second report was by the World Gold Council. And uh, this is all about gold mining's contribution to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. This report, different lens, is a positive collection of their members' contributions across the globe. So it very much sort of brings to the fore good work that uh, many of our companies are doing, but not necessarily directly talking about it in, in, in terms of the SDGs. And to bring it into the really kind of practical realm, is there good case studies, specific examples of mining companies doing things that we could relate back to certain SDGs and say, we could draw a direct line and say, okay, this, this, this action here, this corporate development ties into SDG number six or whatever one it might, may well be. 
we have good examples of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I touched on some of them uh, in, in the article, and I should say that you know that across the board and all of the SDGs, we're, we're doing some work. The Responsible Mining Foundation they sort of also point out where we could do better, for example. But let's just focus on the, uh, the the positive ones. Quality education, SDG number three, developing of local skills. It's something that we do very well in our industry throughout the world, whether it's uh, at, at home in Canada or uh, in Africa or South America. A good example was given by Golden Star Mining, that they've noted that it's the depth of their homegrown talent that has helped them manage through COVID-19 pandemic. So they've had a very strong local base. They're not having to go through all the rigmarole, as we talked about earlier, of getting people in and out of countries. Right? So they've really focused on developing locally. Similarly, so has Endeavor Mining, and they've got a growing local talent that now has 75% of their general managers uh, being West African, and 95% uh, of, of the local workforce is... Uh, is also nationals, but we see that in Canada. You know, I used to work at the uh, the Muscle White Mine now with Newmont um, up in uh, northwestern Ontario, where there was a very clear and distinct goal and target to have over thirty percent of the workforce from the local First Nation communities. And as time has passed, we're now seeing that there are female mining crew leaders doing superb jobs in in, in Canada. Right, so, and so we're sort of developing and growing and helping to develop that talent uh, uh, in the industry. Climate action is another good one, right? So this is SDG 13. Our industry is very much needed in, in terms of providing the raw materials uh, that, that uh, help us transform from a carbon-based economy to one that is more renewable. Uh, so it is such minerals, lithium, cobalt, nickel. Um, interestingly, tin, which is used uh, extensively, almost like the glue that binds all the circuit boards together. So we're very much involved in that side of uh, the aspect. We're also, in terms of climate action, uh, let's take um, the, the Borden mine, and uh, once again with uh, Newmont, one of the first all-electric mines designed that way up front. And so that's uh, another good example. Agnico Eagle, northern Canada up in uh, Nunavut. Uh, putting in roads in conjunction with and consultation with the communities and then making those roads between the different project areas fully available and open to the local communities. One that I got a lot of feedback on, and, and I'm sure that the Board Gold Council did as well when they reported on it, it was uh, SDG number six, clean water and sanitation. So I am Gold, working in Burkina Faso, is working collaboratively with uh, local partners to provide drinking water to over 100,000 people in the Sahel. That's incredibly powerful. That's right? a big and, number. Uh, yeah, and they, they're going to expand on that as well. But also in West Africa, for example, um, Iron Gold have now, one of their mines, I think it's around about 20% of their power needs is coming from solar farms adjacent to the mine. And that's going to be bequeathed to, to, to the state when the mine closes. It's, it's a local partnership. But it also means that they're not having to truck thousands of trucks a year of, uh, of fuel across two countries. Right? So the, the knock-on effects of that are... are compounded positively. Absolutely. I just have to mention one other one, which um, yeah. I, I particularly liked, if, if you don't mind, because it talks, you know, a lot of these companies we talked about are major companies. So Lucara Diamonds, I see uh, Ira Thomas, the CEO there, they go into some incredible detail in the sustainability reports where they've actually identified 10 of the SDGs that they can actively impact. They're in Botswana. Um, so, so, you know, life under the sea is not something that would be readily apparent uh, to, to, and relevant to that particular project, but the ones that they are involved in. They've set 2019 targets. They've actually very clearly defined what their, their performance was against 2019. And, and now they have 2020 targets. So they're very much mapping uh, the business activity to very specific SDGs, reporting on that. And they're also part of the, the Global Compact, which is a group of businesses that are actively supportive in, in promoting the uh, SDGs. Excellent. Well, not overly surprising with Ira Thomas and Lucara doing a lot of innovative things with that company and uh, really carving itself out as an example for as a leader for others to follow. Yeah. Um, and I'm glad you, you segued it there. Uh, a lot of before Lucara, who still a very successful company with operating mm. projects, but a lot of the companies you mentioned, Agnico, I am Gold, Newmont, you know, producers, a lot of capital. Your experience over the years, you understand the junior sector, you understand mm. the mid tiers, you understand the majors, you have that, that great kind of cross spectrum experience. Yeah. What does this mean for junior? So those, it's one thing when you have operating free cash flow and you can invest and you can do the right thing. Um, when you know the situation is for a lot of juniors and they're, they're not maybe putting big holes into, into the earth, but they still are part of this. Are there SDGs that apply to them? Is there 
things that can be done without these kind of big budgets? Anthony, I, I have that comment uh, made, made to me um, quite often, you know, the junior companies, we don't have these budgets, we don't have the departments. And, you know, it's wonderful if you're Mark Risto or any of the other CEOs of the large companies, because you can really do big projects. All right, uh, Mark could find it, for example, another one where Anglo comes in. So then what can junior companies do? First of all, attitude and approach doesn't really cost that much money, all right? So, and, there, and there's many, many thousands of junior companies, which are in so many respects ambassadors for our industry, and often very much the first interface that uh, communities have with mining. So even simple things, so we don't need to, for example, uh, pollute the water. As you mentioned earlier, I'm involved with a company, uh, uh, Condor Gold, uh, in, an, uh, in an area that doesn't have drinking water. So we actually have a water program where we're actually bringing in fresh water for the community to, to use. It doesn't, uh, and we brought it into our budgets and, uh, and it's very, very well received by the community. The, another example from a company that I used to work with, uh, Unigold, and we received uh, some IFC financing. But what we were doing is we were importing, for example, we were importing a core trays, plastic core trays from Canada, along with all the complications of going through the Miami port uh, customs, and then it's the uh, Dominican Republic as well as customs. But we did then go and um, work with some of the local forestries and wood mills and, and asked and, and said, look, we'd like to make wooden core trays. And it might seem like a step backwards, but these are incredibly well made. All the mills were there. Those the, the sustainable forests uh, and woodlands were, were there. And, and so we're able to sort of bring that economy to a very, very small village, which is amounted to um, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So we're able to build that up. You know, other companies, um, if they have their own jewelry, so you can train up local people. There's always, no matter where you're in the world, there's always somebody who knows how to run a motor, fix a motor. Mm -hmm. And these sort of skills can be transferred, reimagined into operating uh, diamond drill rigs and, and working uh, on uh, drill rigs. Uh, so there's a lot that can be done. To my mind, it's often um, just a matter of approach, just look and see what you can do. Uh, but most of all, is actually to be a good neighbor, a good citizen, and realizing that you can make a difference, even at that uh, junior scale. And that's in preparation then, Ideally, of course, everyone, every, every junior company is out there wanting to have a deposit and discover a deposit that will one day uh, be a mine, whether through their own growth or through the purchase by a, a major company. And by having these programs in place, is, it really ticks the boxes, if you like, for major companies as they do their governance and due diligence work on you. Well, you know, you always assume best intentions uh, amongst the executive teams, but a lot of it is just realizing what the first steps are. So I think that's very helpful and very instructive just in terms yeah. of getting that mindset right and some really concrete examples of how juniors might want to think about this crucial file that's only getting more crucial as time goes forward and rightly so. Andrew, listen, you're also just uh, cha turning the channel a little bit as we kind of wrap up here. You were recently announced to the board of uh, Tanzanian Gold. Why don't you tell us a little bit uh, about that company and, and what's up there? So as you know, um... That, that was announced recently, and thank you. Uh, so Tanzanian Gold, obviously w working in Tanzania, uh, in the area around the Bullion Hue mine, the, the, the founder of the company, um, uh, Mr. Jim Sinclair, uh, was also the founder of Sutton Resources, which ultimately went on to become the Bullion Hue mine. So we, we've got a project there. We've, we've met largely around the subject of making a difference, around the subject of sustainable development goals, corporate responsibility, partnerships with local government entities um, on and around mining. So I've been asked to come on board to to help with that aspect of the business and, and, and very enthusiastic about that. And of course, I'll, I'll be out there with my geological hammer too. But uh, the main thing is we're looking at building this mine and very much going to be focused on the SDGs, uh, getting the uh, local content um local production of whatever we can source locally going. We, we, uh, as we continue to build the mine, we'll be working very much on the educational side of things to, to bring in um, local talent uh, as well. And production has just started. And then ultimately, this will be a project that will sort of be heading up towards 200,000 ounces of gold a year. Very, very pleased to be on board. Very exciting. Fantastic. Sounds like a great opportunity. And yes, it's, they've done well to bring your combination of geological skills and technical skills combined with your understanding of what some of the the bigger key issues around sustainable development and socially conscious development of projects is all about 
Andrew, thank you very much for taking the time and joining us from London, UK. We look forward to when you arrive back on Canadian soil in a few weeks' time. Safe travels. Anthony, thank you very much for having me on. I'm going to just leave you with a, a, a thought and a compliment back to you and the Northern Miner. You know, as we make these changes with our industry, it, it requires courageous leadership. And uh, thank you for bringing that to the industry. Um, I think that's really, really important. And I think also just a, a comment from um, Greta Thunberg, who just very recently said that you know, many leaders are happy to set targets for decades in the future, but flinch when immediate action uh, is uh, needed. We do need immediate action. And thank you for providing this uh, opportunity for us to talk about it. Mining with a purpose. Who can dispute that? Let's mine with a purpose. I think what he means specifically is beyond profit, purpose beyond profit. And that's also, I think, something we can all strive for, can't we? Thank you once again for joining me on this episode of The Northern Miner. Once again, Happy New Year to everybody. Thanks for tuning in once again. And if you want to help out the podcast, simply leave us a review in the Apple Podcast directory, send it to your friends. And until next week, take care. Take care.